I want to welcome you again to yes, chapter 12 of our series. I am Father Michael Nabaa. I am president here and uh, I come from Cameroon. I am Father Virginus. I'm a member of the Society of the Divine Savior, um, United States Province, and I work at this parish, the Church of the Resurrection Parish. Okay. So, the theme for our lesson today is going to be the Lord's Prayer, which is the Our Father. And I shall start by asking us to join in reciting it. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Father, I guess that's one of the first prayers which we learn as we grow up. We must have recited those the Our Father many, many times over. And maybe just want to start Father, what comes to your mind when you recite the Our Father? Is there any thought that runs through your mind all the time when you recite it? I think this was the first prayer I learned as a child. Um, what my elder sister Rose taught me this prayer. And um, growing up, it, it, you know, it was more like reciting prayer, and I didn't think much about it. But um, some years into the seminary, I began to think seriously about this prayer. And every time I pray the Our Father now, given where I am in my life, um, it takes on a completely different meaning. And I see it as a complete prayer, um, having all the components of the things that Jesus would want us to pray about and pray for. And me too, I think I can very easily trace the same kind of growth in the meaning of this prayer in my life. And the more I've prayed it, the more I think I have been able also to look maybe a bit more attentively to the different stanzas, to the different uh, tenets that we find in the, up, in, in the prayer. The very first is the first two words. The first word itself, our. Um, the more I've thought about it, the more it is clear that to say the obvious, God is common property. Yes. He is the father of us all. Father of us all. And that means... First, none of us can claim him for himself or for herself alone. And in the second instance, what comes to mind is then that he is there with and for all of us in exactly the same way as the fathers that we know, that we experience, are there for us with love, care, protection, and everything else that we know and would wish a good father to be and to do for us. Father? Yes, um, when we call God Father, our Father, um, like Father Michael has said, it takes me beyond myself, it takes me beyond particularities into the universality of God. God is our our Father. 
I think in terms of collectivity, I think in, I think in terms of um, humanity. Um, and, you know, it, it makes me think of the all-embracing, all-accepting love of God. And it makes me think that everyone, you know, who falls under this umbrella of our Father, not just my Father, is my brother and my sister. And what is even more beautiful, more surprising, is that in calling God our Father, we are calling God Father in the same way in which Jesus called God Father. It means really and truly that we are brothers and sisters of Jesus in the one Father. And since God is king, I love this to think of myself because I am the son of a king. I am a prince because you are a daughter of God who is father and king. You are a princess. We are princes and princesses with Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, of Love, and together, because He is the head and we are the body, we can, as one person, call God in all love and in all trust, Father, Daddy, Abba, as Paul would have us say it. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Um, when we pray the, the Lord's Prayer, uh, it, it starts both as a model and also um, as a prayer that we should pray. If you look at the two places in the scripture that it, 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 Jesus made reference, that, you know, the Math Matthew account, he said, when you pray, um, say, and then Luke says, gives us more of a model to follow. Um, Hallowed be thy name brings to mind the fact that this God we pray to is holy. God is holy. And to be praised, God deserves my worship and your worship. And it begins with faith in God. And so when each time we pray and say, Hallowed be thy name, we are saying, uh, inviting everything that and everyone that calls God Father into an act of worship, divine worship. And so, um, so Father Michael, what really comes to mind when you pray, hallowed be thy name? How does it feel to, to just pray those lines? To, pr to, to pray and literally tell God, I want your name to be holy in my life. I think, you know, it's a commitment. I'm committing myself to try as much as possible to do and to live in such a way that anybody, everybody would recognize in me, would see in me the reality, the name of God. It's as if in what I do, God's name becomes a reality. And so, um, is that no, I think that is what we are all called to be. We're called to be holy. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. It means living the way he would want each and every one of us to live. Which brings us, I think, to the second stanza, uh, which is, Thy kingdom come. Kingdom. Just, uh, I think we're tempted to think about it in terms of glory, in terms of riches, in terms of, you know, all that would make for the way in which we perceive kings and queens and royalty. 
Um, but God's kingdom is different. It's a kingdom, I think, which is real in our lives in the measure, in the way in which we try to make all that Jesus taught us, all that God wants us to be, how that is shown in our lives, in our conduct. Call it, it is a way in which we leave out such little values as love, as truth, as justice, as peace, as the holiness that we just talked about. It's quite interesting uh, because, you know, we call God our Father and then we recognize God's holiness beyond anything else. God is in his own rank. He's God. God is God. Um, but then we move from there to a desire, um, to desire what God desires. And that is God, the reign of God. The, you know, every time we talk about the kingdom, like you said, we're thinking of the pomp and pageantry of kingdoms and monarchies. Uh, no, but we are talking about the reign of God, the, the, the coming of the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of equality and justice and peace, the kingdom of brotherhood and sisterhood, the, the kingdom in which people look out for the, you know, interests of the other. And so... The reign of God, for me, begins with an encounter with this Father and then desiring what he desires, which is that all his creatures be respected and honored. And so um, I think it's a covenant every time we pray, uh, thy kingdom come. We are actually committing to God and saying, we will desire what you desire. We want to live how you live. We want to be holy as you are holy. And um, for me... Uh, that's what comes to my mind every time I pray to, you know, that um, line. And I think once we ask God's kingdom to come, we are, in a way, saying we submit ourselves to what the king of that kingdom is asking us to do. And that is expressed, I think, again, very beautifully in the very next uh, line very next standard which in which we say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven it is interesting the way in which jesus put this because in heaven god's will is done perfectly down here on earth there are so many distractions <laughs> there is so much there is so much competition for our attention that if we are not careful we can completely forget about God's will in our lives, in the lives of others, and pay attention only to what we want, to what our will is. And so this, I think, is a very, very timely reminder. God's will is supreme. But I'll confess one thing, that this is perhaps the most difficult verse of this prayer for me personally for the simple reason that it is very easy to say your will not my will but it is difficult to do his will and not my will you're right um Thy will be done on earth as, as it, it is, is in heaven. Uh, is as human beings we want to do our will. It's, it's tough to do God's will. But I think this is where the whole encounter piece comes in. When we encounter a father who is not just a father to the good, but also a father to the bad, who is not just a father to one group or the other, but a father to all, it, it kind of positions us to um, begin to see from God's lens and to understand that if his will is done among us, if we subject and submit ourselves to his will, 
being done among us as it is done in heaven, though we are here in a world that is imperfect, then a lot of things become easier. And it is difficult because it goes contrary to the things that we would want as human beings Absolutely. and the things that we love and the things that we want to do. And so they seem to be just countercultural. And so it takes pain out of us. But I mean, n nothing good comes without the, you know, the bad bank, bad, bad banks, you know. Yeah. So I think that third uh, or the fourth verse there, it pretty much ends the first part yes. of the Our Father. That first part pays attention to God as He mm. is God. It's we're praising Him, we're acknowledging that He is God. Now I think. In the second part of the prayer, <laughs> we are needy human beings, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, we are. <laughs> Each time we come to God is that, 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 that. But mm -hmm. again, in very, very typical fashion, Jesus is able to summarize for us the different needs that we can have in three, four short lines. And the very, very first is the need for food. Yeah. The need for food. We need it to be able to have energy to do, to do the things that we, we have to do. We need it to stay alive. We need it to, you know, just live, live from one day to the next. And so part of who we are as children is a certain dependence on our father, on our parents for all that we we are. I don't know how this came in here. Sorry. For all that we are. And so food is representative of life, of bodily life, of physical life. And we're telling God, without you, because we know you provide for us physically. If you don't give us directly, maybe you give us parents, you give us guardians who would go out there, do work, and be earn able to money. earn money and be able to provide for us in so many different and beautiful ways. Yes. Uh, it, it, I want to underscore the, the one thing that I found, uh, found in this verse, which is um, divine providence, the power of divine providence. And um, give us this day our daily bread. Um, it is a sign that we trust that God will give us what is needed for our sustenance and when it is needed. So um, divine providence is huge actually with Salvatorians. <laughs> forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now we've talked about our need for food. Now we are um, asking for our need for forgiveness, for forgiveness. Um, we, as human beings, we, we offend others, we hurt others. We hurt ourselves too by our behaviors or by the things that we say or do or fail to do. And so um, sometimes sin can become a weight, a burden that only God can lift. And this next verse says, Forgive us, but then it has a condition to it. Um, it's a condition that invariably says, if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. Mm -hmm. If you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. So we are asking God to forgive us since we commit to also the, the, um, to forgiving other people their own sins, knowing our own weaknesses as well. And... I think this again is one of the more difficult things in the spiritual life. And I want to tell you again from my little experience that forgiveness at first sight is about the person whom we forgive. In reality, very often, it is about us. It is about the peace. It is about, you know, clearing sometimes blockages to our spiritual life, to praying because we are carrying somebody 
in our hearts because we allow that person sometimes to even take over our lives completely. If we don't forgive, it can degenerate into resentment, into hate. It can actually drive love out of our lives. And so it's something we need to take very seriously and pray for, for the grace to be as forgiving as God is towards us and to forgive without any conditions. And to do this, um, uh, we need grace, like Father said, uh, which leads us into the next one. Um, it says, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Once Jesus was talking to his disciples and he says, temptation to sin is bound to come. So we are not asking God to lead us in a way that we will never face temptations. No. Um, temptations train our muscles to become better. It's like uh, moving to the next class, you have to write exams. If you don't pass, you don't move to the next class. So um, exams, as much as we don't like them, I don't myself, <laughs> but they can become a test, a proof that you are ready for the next level. And so Jesus says, give us the grace not to um, walk right into things that can destroy us. Give us the grace to recognize, tell, tell signs, warning signs of things that um, can separate us from both God and our neighbor. And the person who tempts us is the evil one. It is Satan. It is the devil. You know, there is a little thing about the fact that if you take the E, sorry, if you take the D away from devil, what you have is, is evil because the devil is responsible for evil. all the evil. And uh, I think I often think of my life, of my soul, especially as a battleground between God and Satan between good and evil. And the beautiful thing about it is that, number one, no matter how tempted we are, if we are open to the grace of God, temptation, that temptation, will never fall into that temptation, and that means we will not sin, we will not commit the sin that we are tempted to commit. And uh, so, um, in as much as I think it is very clear to us that God is present with us, I think that presence is not to be taken for granted, that very often we have got to consciously turn to God in those moments when we know we are weak and we know ourselves very, very well. But a body before he left was like, hey, when I was seven years old, what was I tempted to do? Well, when I was or when I was in your grade, for example, what were the things that I, I was tempted to do? Cheat, look over in some other person's paper during an <laughs> exam, sometimes be mean to my siblings, be mean to my friends, sometimes to be lazy, sometimes not to do the chores at home that were expected of me, I was tempted in that way. But what is it that helps us to overcome temptation? It is sometimes going back to God. It is asking God, number one, you know I am weak in this way. By myself, I can't do this. So please, God, always be by me to give me the strength to overcome those little difficulties that I will always encounter. And the last one, deliver us from evil, is, um, is it clearly shows that you know the evil one is at work. Like you said, our lives, our destinies, our souls are a battleground uh, between God and the devil. And and sometimes um, 
the devil is so out there working and wreaking havoc that we can get afraid. But Jesus says we should pray that God's grace will be enough in, in those moments of temptation. You know. So we close out this chapter, this lesson, um, with the prayer of reconciliation on page 132. Turn to page 132, the prayer of reconciliation. I'll be the leader, and Father will be all. I'll be group one, and he will be group two. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but we'll navigate it together. Almighty and eternal God, you constantly offer pardon and call on sinners to trust in your forgiveness alone. We turn our hearts to you. Never did you turn away from us. Though time and again we have broken your covenant. We turn our hearts to you. You have bound the human family to yourself through Jesus, your Son, our Redeemer, with a new bond of love so tight that it can never be undone. We turn our hearts to you. Even now you set before your people a time of grace and reconciliation. We turn our hearts to you. Thank you for your time. Um, it was good being with you at this time. And we hope that you learned so much about the Lord's Prayer. And special thanks to Father Michael. Enjoy your week. And God bless you. Bless you.